the cardiologist did say to my brother and I that, you know, your dad's had a heart attack at 41, which is very young. Your grandfather had a heart attack in his early sixties. So you and your brother, my brother's three years older than I, you're pretty much young men. You need to keep an eye on this because cardiovascular disease runs in families. I'm Light Watkins, and today I've got another bite-sized plot twist podcast episode for you, which is a shorter clip from a past episode where the guest shares the story of that pivotal moment in their life that directed them toward what ultimately became their path and their purpose. And sometimes that plot twist looks like getting fired from a job or losing a bunch of money, or in the case of today's guest, Simon Hill, it was Simon's father suffering a heart attack at the young age of 41. And a cardiologist warned Simon that due to his genetics and lifestyle, he could be next. Let's listen in. That period for me, it, although I didn't realize it at the time, it did plant that seed, which would then go, you know, later kind of fuel me to, to progress my studies and, and, and write the book. But what one thing at that time that really did stick in, in my mind was we had a kind of family consultation with the cardiologist a bit of a debrief, you know, this is what's gone down. Uh, you know, here's your dad's prognosis. Here's what his health could look like from here. Uh, and all of that, you know, we were very relieved, as I say, you know, we were just happy that he was alive and the conversation kind of ended there and well, not kind of, it did end there. And so for, for a long while, my brother and I, you know, our, kind of takeaway from that was that we had been dealt a, a, a sort of bad genetic card and that we need to keep an, an eye on this and that, you know, who knows, we may end up in the same position uh, as dad in our early 40s. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you wanted to go to medical school, but you changed your mind at the last minute. So mm -hmm. talk, walk us through the next few years, uh, after high school, knowing that you were on a collision course with some sort of heart problem genetically mm -hmm. and not feeling like you had many, um, many options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can, I think I want to kind of clarify that although I had that mindset, I was living life to the fullest, perhaps because I thought that, Hey, anything can happen. So it wasn't like it was getting me down and, and, and I wasn't enjoying life. In fact, it was probably the opposite. Um, and you're right. You've done your research. I, I wanted to go to, to med school. Uh, I didn't get the marks, quite get the marks to, to go to the, the medical school in Melbourne and at university of Melbourne. And. I had the decision of, to, to go down and do medical school in Tasmania, uh, which I've since gone and, and traveled and is a beautiful place. But at the time I wanted to keep playing football. I had a lot of friends in Melbourne. I wasn't really wanting to give up the, the kind of the social side of things. It, it wasn't, um, that appealing for me. So I switched direction, uh, undertook a, a bachelor of science degree in physiotherapy and uh progressed through that and and started working as a sports physiotherapist in private practice and with elite footballers in in melbourne and then you know eventually you know some years later i i realized that i had a, a pretty good understanding of physio physiology and anatomy and uh a lot of understanding about uh, managing sports injuries and rehabilitation but i did have this real curiosity for nutrition, uh, particularly having come across some information that suggested, uh, our, our nutrition, the way we eat can, can really affect our risk of cardiovascular disease. And that inspired me to go back to, to university. And I did a master's in nutrition science at Deakin university. Uh, and that was after you had your experience with your brother, right? That's right. Yeah. So he was basically that little bit of kind of information that opened my eyes to, Hey, you know, I'm feeling really healthy right now, but given my, my family history, maybe there's something here that I should look at a little more deeply. So this is, this is kind of what opened my eyes to how confusing nutrition is 
and is what inspired mm -hmm. me to then go and say, hey, I actually want to go and study this in detail so I can actually decode it because it seems mm -hmm. like another language and it's so confusing with, you know, people online with, you know, seemingly the same qualifications, but coming at this from very different angles. Um, and so the story is I was living in Sydney at this time. Uh, my brother was, was coming to visit, uh, with his fiance to stay for, for a week or two weeks, I think it was. And he called me up. I think the first time was, was about three months beforehand. And he, he said, look, just want to give you the, the heads up that, uh, Lauren and I have, you know, changed the way that we're eating. And I said, okay. And, and he said, yeah, we're, we're no longer eating red meat or, or chicken. We're, we're still eating fish. We're, we're eating a sort of pescatarian style diet. And I thought, okay, well, that's fine. And, and I think he was giving me the heads up just so that, you know, shopping and, and the restaurants we, we would go to. Um, would accommodate for that. Not that that's very difficult to accommodate for. And, and then, you know, I, I didn't hear from him for a little while. And then about a week before he came, he, he called me back up and said, look, I just want to give you, uh, a bit more of an update where we've actually changed the way we're eating again. We're no longer eating fish. And I, at that stage, I was saying, well, what, what's left? Uh, you know, animal protein for me, light was a very, very big part of my diet, a huge part. Um, I think that was a result of the kind of fitness industry and the football sort of environment I was, I was in at the time. Um, and so he kind of explained to me that they, they'd stopped eating seafood and I said, okay, well, I'm not sure where we're going to eat if we're going to to go out to any restaurants, so I'll leave that to you. And when when you get up, we can go to the grocery store, and uh, you can you can help me. And to be honest, they came up, and it wasn't really a big deal. They loved to cook. They cooked a lot of great food. Uh, we had a really good time. I think we went out to a couple restaurants that they chose. And uh, other than than sort of my brother just saying that he was making these decisions for his cardiovascular health primarily. Um, and he, and, and sending me a couple links to, to a few kind of podcasts. Um, other than that, I just really enjoyed the food. And I think, you know, it took some weeks after that for me to kind of muster up the energy and, and kind of get some space and, and think to myself, well, Hey, maybe there is something to this, uh, but also remember back to, to, to what I was saying about my dad, I'm not sure if I added this when you asked about some of his influences on us, being skeptical is something that my dad has reiterated to us, you know, for as long as, as, as I can recall. And I was very skeptical of what my brother, the, what he was kind of sending to me. And I was kind of you know, wearing this hat of, Hey, I've done a bachelor of, of science. I'm going to, I'm going to take a deep dive and I'll let you know what I think of it. And in some ways I, I wanted to kind of prove my brother wrong because my diet at that time, which was very rich in animal protein, particularly, uh, red meat and chicken, it felt like it was serving me quite well. I felt fit and, and healthy. So I had no real reason to kind of change that. Um, had he, who got him into it? Did Lauren watch like forks overnight and say, honey, you have to watch this. And then they watched it together type of a thing. I think he, he had actually come across a couple of podcasts where folks like Rich Roll were getting interviewed and then they mm -hmm. listened to, to Rich's, uh, um, audio book. Um, but my brother, he, he's, he comes from a marketing kind of sales background. He wasn't doing a deep dive into the science. He had, you know, been sent a bit of information about people that had made the transition to, to change their diet and also some information around various populations that were living long, healthy lives without some of the diseases that we have and what their kind of dietary habits looked like. But so at that level, at that stage, this was, you know, I guess very surface level 
kind of information. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. But you guys grew up in the same house. So you both mm -hmm. were exposed to this whole skepticism mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, influence. So he did he know how to approach you with this information? Like Simon is not into the hard sell or Simon needs to hear scientific evidence or Simon is let me appeal to his physique or, you know, did he, did he kind of, how did he lure you into the, the club? Well, I think, I mean, during that week, certainly it wasn't like, I, I'm just asking because I, I have three yeah. brothers and I was vegan for a long time. And none of them, I couldn't get anybody to, yeah. to eat like that. So no, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to formulas. kind of, to, to think back on. And I haven't really asked him, um, too much about that, but if I was to, to kind of just think back to, to that period, he certainly was not sending me scientific studies. You know, he just shared, he shared a couple of, of things that he'd listened to and they, they cooked good food and, and we went to restaurants that served good food. Um, you know, I think you kind of have to remember uh, my, my brother going through high school and into university, his interest was never really in science and mine was. So kind of in our relationship, um, you know, he has his skill sets in, a, in another area to mine. So I think when it came to this kind of uh, area of, of health and wellness, uh, I don't think he would come to it from a point, a position of kind of trying to show me the, the science, so to speak. Um, it was more, Hey, this is what I'm doing. And look, if you're interested, this is why, but it was kind of just teeing me up for my own kind of journey to deep dive it. But as I said, I was, I was very skeptical. Um, and, and I do remember saying to him many times that I'm not sure if what he was doing was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then a lot of people would you know, decide, okay, I'm going to read a few books about this or I'm going to watch a documentary or listen to some podcasts. You decide to go to master's, you get your master's in nutrition, which is, which is, um, mm -hmm. going above and beyond to understand this. What, what, what was it that, that propelled you to go that far with it? Well, did you not like physical therapy and physiology mm -hmm. and all of that? Or are you thinking about career shift? So it, it wasn't that I immediately enrolled in, in a master's in nutrition science. What I did do to, to begin with was go into the peer reviewed literature. So in my undergraduate mm -hmm. degree, I did, I did honors and, and that involved actually conducting my own study and, and writing it up and learning about study design and methodology, uh, results and a little bit of data analyzing and then you know, coming to your own discussion and conclusion. So I had some skills to kind of read peer reviewed science, but very quickly going in and, and looking at nutrition science without any formal training in that, I realized that it's a whole different beast. And I didn't have the necessary skills to, to actually make sense of it. And I mentioned before that you know, if you look in the media or you just look online, you can see people that have, you know, both maybe have MD after their name, but come to very, very different conclusions. And so I was at that stage, I was kind of in a position where I feel like a lot of people are, where they're just very confused and you kind of just throw your hands up in the air and think, well, nobody's got this worked out. And, and I think that, and that, uh, like frustration, there was frustration at that point. I, I think that is what sort of inspired me. I, I had to kind of get the skills at my end so that I could actually start to, to make sense of, of nutrition science and, and understand what a, a healthy diet looked like. And, um, you know, to answer your question as to whether I was kind of bored of, of physiotherapy uh, or not, you know, I love physiotherapy. I think it's a fantastic, uh, profession. I had, you know, so many 
great memories there and, and, and really great learnings that set me up for what I'm doing today. But I did feel like there was this huge gap in my understanding of health. And even in those football club environments, uh, when, when, when it came to nutrition, it just seemed like there was a very cookie cutter approach. All players were doing the same thing. There wasn't any talk of, of evidence. And so, yeah, I did, I kind of had this, this, uh, brewing curiosity to, to go away and learn this at a deeper level and then hopefully become a kind of more rounded health professional. Uh, can we talk a little bit about those differences? You said that uh, nutrition mm -hmm. studies, that was a different beast. How was that different based on study design and methodology? Yeah. So there are so many moving parts when it comes to our diet that I think people can appreciate. And if I say to you, hey, light, is red meat good or bad, right? Well, in what dietary pattern, for who, how old are they? What exposure level? And when I say what exposure level, I mean, are we talking about 50 grams a week, 50 grams a day, 200 grams a week, 200 grams a day? Um, how long for? And compared to what? Are we talking about red meat compared to a Mars bar? Are we talking about red meat compared to whole grains? Are we talking about red meat compared to legumes? Are we talking about red meat compared to fish? And so I think you can start to appreciate right now that there are so many studies out there and unless you get into those and really understand the parameters of those, those studies, it, it can be, you can quickly come to the wrong conclusions. And so an example of this would be, let's say, um, I, I want to look at a, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to use a, a, a vegan diet here because I think this illustrates an important point. Let's say I, I find a study that shows a vegan diet, uh, improves health markers. And, and let's say we're, we're talking about things like blood pressure and cholesterol. Now, quite often that, that's, that study might make headlines. Now, a really important question to ask there was compared to what did, did they just compare a vegan diet to a standard American diet, what we would call a dummy diet that basically mm -hmm. anything can beat. And a lot of times that's the case. Now you might think, well, you don't need to go to, 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 to university to learn that, but I'm giving you a very simple example <laughs> of, 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 of essentially just needing to, to understand the art of nutrition science, how these studies are being conducted so that when you're reading them, you can be aware of these things. Um, another example would be if you take a population of people and let's say you, you, you're trying to work out how does red meat affect someone's health outcomes? And we take a population of people and we track them for 20 years. Now, if, if we find an association, people that eat more red meat have more heart attacks. An important question to, to sort of think about there is, well, what else do people that eat more red meat do? Do they drink more alcohol? Do they exercise less? Do they smoke more? Are they of lower socioeconomic status or higher? Do they have different education levels? All of these other things that we know also correlate with health outcomes. And, and, and so, um, what I would be looking for uh, in a study now that is say, looking at that particular question is, did they use a, what's called a multivariate statistical analysis to adjust for these, what we call confounding variables and what a confounding variable means. People will hear this is essentially in, in a particular study, we're looking at an exposure. So in that example, red meat and an outcome, and let's say the outcome is heart attacks. A confounding variable is any other kind of variable that could be affecting that outcome, like smoking or alcohol or these other factors. And when we, in, in a good cohort, which is that kind of study I've, I've explained there of a population, often that's called epidemiology mm -hmm. or observational science. In a good mm -hmm. study, the researchers will consider what are the possible confounding variables. And you can imagine light in order to actually adjust for those, that means that when you're actually collecting data, you have to ask the questions. You have to find out. And, 
And then again, how, how good that adjustment is depends on how good your questions are. Did you just ask people, do you drink or not? Or did you try and find out, do people drink on average one drink a day, two drinks a day, three drinks a day? Did you just ask if people smoke or not? Or did you find out if they have 20 cigarettes a week or 10 or five? And how, so how well defined your population is in terms of all of these parameters will affect how well you can adjust for these confounding variables. All of that can sound confusing. The point of that is the better the data and the better that statistical adjustment, the more certain or the more confident, I should say, we can be that our finding is an accurate reflection of that exposure and how that exposure affects that outcome. So when you're reading a study, unless a lay person is reading a study, do they, do they clearly state that this study involved a multivariant statistical analysis? Is that like a standardized classification mm -hmm. where they're the same 200 metrics to make sure that they accounted for all of these different confounding variables? Yes. And you'll see it in the method section, in the method section, there'll be, uh, a particular section for statistical analysis, which will describe exactly what I just went through. And then usually when they show the results, which go through, and again, in order to read the results, uh, I mean, you could, you could sort of self train, but a lot of that I've learned through doing my masters, you're looking at data and effect sizes and confidence intervals and a lot of, you know, it's, it's another language, but underneath that table of those results will show these different, uh, what we call adjustment models. And that is the, the multivariate analysis. And, and I kind of went into quite a surface level example there. It does go a lot deeper depending on the study and depending on what exposure and outcome they're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, um, you obviously put a lot of studies in your book later, and I'm not sure if you knew you were ever going to write a book in these earlier days. Were you like, did you have a, when I first started getting into meditation and I knew that I was going to become a teacher one day, I had a binder. And every time I came across an inspirational story or just something that I thought that really resonated with me, I would store it away in my little binder. And so at some point, my binder would have hundreds of pages of different mm -hmm stories and anecdotes and different teachings. Did you have an equivalent of that uh, when you were studying all of this? And what did that look like? It was online. Uh, and that was probably just to, to kind of, uh, I was printing quite a few papers at the beginning, but then they start to stack up like my dad. And I thought, I can't do this. <laughs> I'm not inheriting this habit. Uh, so I had, I, I, I mean, I'm so thankful, like from, from the beginning, I set up, uh, a kind of online, um, database of studies as I'd go through them and I would categorize them. So I would categorize them kind of broadly by the, uh, area of health or health outcome, if it's cardiovascular disease or dementia or cancer, and then within there start subcategories. Um, so I do have this kind of catalog of, of studies or archive that I can go back to at, at any moment. But, um, yeah, you're right. I didn't think I was going to write a book. I was, I was doing that just so that I could personally, I could retrieve this information quite quickly if I needed to. So one of the big phrases from the whole pandemic era was, you know, there'd be some online argument or conflict and then someone will say, you need to go do your research. And you, you, you talk about that. Um, in your book, this whole idea of doing your research, and it's not as it's not as as uh, simple if you properly doing research based on what we just talked about. But it sounds like you were actually doing proper research. Talk about that. Talk about why it's not so easy to do your research. Well, for many of the the kind of um, things we've been through so far, with regards to understanding the details of a study, and. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, zooming back out first, appreciating that there is an evidence hierarchy and, mm -hmm. and so we have this, um, uh, sort of pyramid that, that helps us, um, uh, kind of 
categorize different types of science by less reliable and less valid to more reliable, more valid. And, and the very bottom of that is kind of expert opinion. If someone just says something, um, that's not very valid or, or reliable unless they're pointing to a study. But in that case, we're, we're thinking about the study. Um, and then, you know, as a rung above that, you have your kind of laboratory type studies. They could be on animals or in a Petri dish on cells. Again, not very reliable or valid for extrapolating to humans. And, and we know that we actually know that the translation of that research is it's a very low percentage of what we see at that level that translates to humans. Uh, and then a step above that is your kind of population studies where you're looking at people out in the wild and you're trying your best to adjust for these confounding variables. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's how we worked out that smoking is not a great idea. It's through those studies, right? So often people say, well, these population studies, there's so many confounding variables, but um, we just have to appreciate that it's, it's, it's not feasible to run a clinical intervention for everything. Can you imagine if right now I said, well, like, you know, for smoking, I want to randomize people into uh, a smoking group and a non-smoking group, and I want to track them for 60 plus years. Um, you know, and, 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 and in order to, to kind of get to that position, to want to do that study first, I've seen say 7,000 observational studies that tell me there's a strong correlation between smoking and cancer. It's not going to pass an ethics board to, to randomize people to smoking when we have that much observational evidence that it's not a good idea first and foremost, but then you can imagine that. There's all sorts of adherence issues. It's so expensive to run a randomized controlled trial for that long. Um, so the, the observational studies are, are, are a really important piece of the puzzle. They help us explore questions that we can't explore with clinical interventions. Now, certainly clinical interventions are uh, more robust in that they allow us to control for these kind of confounding variables better. Um, the idea with the clinical intervention, a randomized controlled trial is that the only difference between the two groups, because you've done a random allocation is the exposure that you're looking at. So if we were to have, uh, two groups that, that let's say, uh, adopt different diets and we do a randomized controlled trial. Uh, we would expect that the background incidence of say alcohol and smoking and exercise and everything else is the same. And in fact, after mm -hmm. they do a randomization, the researchers will check that and make sure that that randomization was actually, um, random and, and those kind of, there was no differences in those baseline characteristics. Um, so, uh, understanding that evidence hierarchy. Um, would be an important first step if someone's going to kind of quote unquote, do, do their own research. Um, and then getting into each of the individual, uh, studies and looking at the, the methodology, um, you know, some of those things that I mentioned before about compared to what, what exposure amount, what population, um, thinking about all of these things, looking at the data analysis, is there an appropriate uh, adjustment for confounding factors. And you can really, I think, begin to appreciate that this is a specialty and it can be very hard for someone to do if, if this is not the, the area that you're trained in, um, which is goes for many different thing, you know, careers in, in life. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.